And so our theme then this evening, Richard Sitz on entertaining the Holy Spirit. In his book, Preaching and Preachers, Martin Lloyd-Jones writes this about Richard Sipps. I shall never cease to be grateful to one Puritan, Richard Sipps, who was balm to my soul at a period in my life where I, when I was badly overworked and overtired, and therefore subject in an unusual manner to the onslaughts of the devil. I found at that time that Richard Sibbs was an unfailing remedy. His books, The Bruised Reed and The Soul's Conflict, quietened, soothed, comforted, encouraged, and healed me. Richard Sibbs was one of the greatest Puritans of his age. He greatly influenced the direction and content of Puritan preaching, of Puritan theology, and Puritan publication in England and in New England. And his theology of the Holy Spirit was especially important because of its emphasis on how the Holy Spirit operates in the daily life of the Christian. And it's in that context that he winsomely speaks of entertaining the Holy Spirit in your own soul. He writes, There is nothing in the world so great and so sweet a friend that will do us so much good as the Holy Spirit, providing we give him entertainment. So what does he mean by entertainment? Well, you read him in the context of all his writings, I think we can say there are four areas that are involved in this entertainment, and I'll set them before you one by one this evening, but before I do that, I want to give you just a quick summary of the man's life so we can set this in the context. Richard Sibbs was a native of Suffolk, a Puritan county of Old England that furnished numerous illustrious emigrants to New England. He was born in 1577. As a child already, he loved books, much to the dismay of his father, who was a real wheelwright. And his father began to buy him wheelwright tools and tried to take away his books. And Richard, young Richard kept buying books. And so finally, with the support of others, not with the support of his father, he got admitted to St. John's College in Cambridge at the age of 18. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree, then a fellowship in 1601, Master of Arts degree, 1602. In 1603... He was converted as a young adult under the preaching of the famous Puritan Paul Baines, whom he called my father in the gospel. He was then ordained as a deacon and a priest in Norwich in 1607, chosen as one of the college preachers in 1609, received a Bachelor of Divinity degree in 1610. From 1611 to 1616, he served as a lecturer at Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge, where God blessed his preaching to awaken Cambridge from the spiritual indifference into which it fell after the death of the so-called father of Puritanism, William Perkins. Actually, a gallery had to be built to accommodate all the visitors. John Cotton, the famous New England Puritan, and Hugh Peters were both converted under Sibbs' preaching. And during those years at Holy Trinity, Sibbs also helped to turn the famous Thomas Goodwin away from Arminianism. And he moved John Preston from so-called witty Anglican preaching to plain spiritual preaching. Sibbs came to London in 1617 as a lecturer for Gray's Inn, the largest of the four great inns of the court. In 1626, Sibbs complimented this lectureship by becoming Master of Catherine Hall, now St. Catherine's College at Cambridge. Under his leadership, the college returned to its former prestige. It graduated several men that would later serve at the preeminent Westminster Assembly. And shortly after that, Sibbs earned his Doctor of Divinity degree at Cambridge. But all his education never went to his head, so to speak. In fact, 
just the opposite. He soon became called, nicknamed the Heavenly Doctor by nearly everyone due to his godly preaching and his heavenly conversation. As Malcolm said earlier today, Isaac Walton wrote of him and it became a, a little ditty that was well known in the Puritan community. Of this blessed man, let this just praise be given. Heaven was in him before he was in heaven. Sibs never got married. But he established an astonishing network of friendships that included a variety of godly ministers, illustrious lawyers, parliamentary leaders of the early Stuart era. Wherever he found the godly, he found friends. He once said, Godly friends are my walking sermons. On 13 occasions, he wrote introductions to the writings of his Puritan colleagues. Sips was a gentle man, a warm man. He avoided the controversies of his day as much as possible. Factions, he said, breed fractions. His battles with Archbishop Laud, Roman Catholics, and Arminians were the exception for him, not the norm. And till his, till his death, he, re, he remained close friends with scores of pastors and leaders, even those who espoused more radical reform than he did for the Church of England. Sibbs was an inspiration to many of his brethren. He influenced Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, and Independency, all three dominant forms of the church in England at that time. He was a pastor of pastors. And Puritans everywhere recognized him as a great, Christ-centered, experiential preacher. Both learned and unlearned in upper and lower classes profited greatly from Sips. He was known as an alluring preacher. And he once wrote, In my sermons, I mean to woo. For to preach is to woo sinners. The main scope of all preaching is to allure us, notice the word, to the entertainment of Christ's mild, safe, wise, victorious government. Sibs brought truth home, as Robert Burns would later say, to men's business and bosoms. His biographer, Zachary Catlin, wrote of Sibs, No man that ever I was acquainted with got so far into my heart and lay so close in it. Sibs' last sermons, preached one week before his death, were expositions, morning and evening, of John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And when asked just two days before he died, how his soul was faring, Sib said, I should do my God much wrong if I should not say very well. Sib's will and testament dictated on July 4, 1635, the day before his death, commences, I commend and bequeath my soul into the hands of my gracious Savior who hath redeemed it with his most precious blood and appears now in heaven to receive it. Well, this is the man who said, let us entertain the Holy Spirit. So what does he mean by it? Well, first of all, he means that we need to be conscious when we are believers of cultivating the preciousness of the indwelling Spirit. The in dwelling spirit. Sib said that the moment the Holy Spirit enters a man's life, in the hour of regeneration, he comes to abide. He comes to live, to indwell, to take up his residence in that person's soul. And his idea was like this. If you're going to invite some people over to your home, and you're going to entertain them for an evening. What you do is you go around and you maybe you vacuum and you, you, you put away the scattered newspapers and you, you clean up a little bit, don't you? You, you prepare a bit for, for the entertainment. And Sip said, when you entertain the Holy Spirit, you have this reverence for His indwelling. 
You don't want to live sloppily, carelessly, the Christian life. You want to entertain the Spirit through the means of grace. That indweller, you want him to be a blessing to you. Now Sib said, the Holy Spirit is therefore the bond of union. The bond of union between Christ and us and between God and us. It's by the Spirit and His indwelling that we come into fellowship of the Father and the Son and then come to live by faith out of Him. Now that's really reminiscent of, of John Calvin. You know, Calvin said the Spirit is the bond between Christ and us from God's side, and faith is the bond from our side that enables us to lay hold of Jesus Christ and the Father in fellowship through the Spirit. Well, Sip said something very similar, but there is a greater focus on this indwelling. Now when we entertain the Holy Spirit through this indwelling, there are four things involved as we read Sibs and we glean and we put it together, four things involved. The first thing we can summarize in the word communion. Communion. If we are believers, the Holy Spirit establishes communion between us and the other two members of the Trinity. Sibs says, it's as if he captures us and lifts us up to know the Father and the Son's love for us. He lifts us up to see by faith the crucified, resurrected Jesus, seated in glory. That is why the Spirit comes, says Sibs. He takes the things of Christ. He wants to knit our hearts to God the Father and to His Son. And therefore, Sibs says, we may say that while in one sense, fellowship between ourselves and God is restored once and for all, he's referring to regeneration, yet in another sense, the Spirit in a daily conscious way works for that restoration of fellowship during our entire lives. It's always, you see, we are to entertain that spirit, to obey his word, to, to, to seek to live well, pleasing to his sight, that we might enjoy that indwelling, and that that indwelling might daily, consciously bring us into the fellowship through the word of the Father and of the Son. Communion with God a triune God. For when the Spirit indwells us, Jesus tells us in in John that there where the Spirit dwells, I and my Father shall come and take abode, our abode in that man. So ultimately, by the Spirit, we actually have fellowship and communion, as John Owen would say in his classic communion with God, with every person of the Trinity. But to entertain the Holy Spirit through His indwelling also involves government. Government, Sib says. Because when the Spirit draws us to the Father and the Son, He confirms His government in our hearts. And this government is cohabiting with the Spirit's purpose of revealing the things of Christ to us. The Spirit wants to take us out of ourselves to Jesus Christ, but at the same time to govern us from within so that we can appreciate and treasure Christ. That our soul may be fit to entertain not only the Spirit, but the Son of God. And so the Spirit lives in us to restore us and transform our souls and ripen us for eternal glory with Jesus Christ. And in that government, Sib says, Submission is absolutely critical. In his classic, A Fountain Sealed, Sibs writes, Let us give up the government of our souls to the Holy Spirit. It's for our safety so to do. For he is much wiser than we ourselves are. We are not able to direct our own way. It is our liberty to be under a wisdom and goodness larger than our own. Let the Spirit think in us. Let the Spirit desire in us. Let the Spirit pray in us. Let the Spirit live in us. Let the Spirit do all in us. Labor ever to be in such a frame as we may be fit for the Spirit to work upon. 
And then Sibs goes on, and he compares our inmost soul and the spirits indwelling to a musical instrument. It's a fascinating part. Tuned and played by the spirit. Sibs writes, Let us lay ourselves open to the spirit's touch through the word, so that when the spirit has ruling sway in our lives, he fine-tunes our souls much like a musical instrument, and then he plays out our lives as a piano concerto before God. And then he goes on to describe that process of tuning in the touch of the Holy Spirit. He said that Spirit will have the keys of our lives delivered to him. We must submit to his government. When he is in our heart, he will subdue us little by little. He will subdue all our high thoughts, our rebellious risings, our despairing fears. But how do you know? How do you know if this is the Spirit's touch? If this is the Spirit's work, the Spirit's indwelling, the Spirit's government? Well, Sibs addresses that question. And his answer is this. By living and moving, by actions vital, even so may a man know whether he hath the blessed Spirit of God and his blessed effects and operations in his own soul. For the Spirit is not idle in us. But as the soul quickens the body so the Spirit does the soul. Every saving grace is a sign the Spirit is within you. Well, that reminds me, actually, of John Preston. You know, John Preston said, how do you know if the Spirit is really within you? He said, well, it's like a pregnant woman. If she feels no movement at all for a few days, she's worried. Is there life at all? You see, and so a believer who feels no movement in his soul. That's what Sibs is referring to. No actions vital. No goings out of the soul to God. No desires for communion. He ought to be concerned. Maybe he's a believer who's backsliding, but he ought to be concerned. Where is the presence of the indwelling spirit? Where are the actions vital? Where is the living and the moving? Where is the life inside of me? So Sibs is saying, wherever the indwelling spirit is, he gradually is transforming the soul. He's working in the soul. And that total government is not something realized immediately, of course. No. Sibs writes, the revolution and overthrow of our old nature comes upon conversion while the government of the spirit is established in a process. A process whereby we may learn more of and abide more to the constitution of our new life in Jesus Christ. So he's saying, use the means of grace, labor to entertain the Spirit by surrendering your lives, your heart, to the Spirit's indwelling. The third word is spiritual warfare. Sibs is fascinating here. He says, that indwelling Spirit, as you give him entertainment, it doesn't mean your life is going to get easy and smooth. In fact, you could have more trouble than ever. But what it does mean is that whatever troubles he deems fit in his inscrutable sovereignty to put upon you, he designs them to bring you into spiritual warfare, into external struggles and internal struggles, so that you learn to depend more on the indwelling of the Spirit within you. Externally, we face the powers of darkness, even the prince of darkness himself, because the devil is profoundly envious of the man that walks in the spirit. You walk in the spirit, you'll have more temptations from Satan. Because Satan hates it. That's what Sibs is saying. All spiritual graces meet with conflict. Sibs writes, for that which is true is so with a great deal of resistance from that which is counterfeit. What is of the Spirit is always in conflict, in holy war, with that which is not of the Spirit. But that's true also internally. Our fleshly desires are continually at war with the Spirit. For when the Spirit comes to a person, he pulls down strongholds, he carves out a path, Sib says, for himself in the thick of the battle. And Sib compares the Christian life to a narrow path with a hedge on both sides. And he pictures demons on the other side trying to shoot 
arrows as the believer walks along the path. And how critical it is, then you see, to have this Spirit indwelling us, to give us the strength. For our soul is a battlefield on which the Spirit marches, and He will have the final victory, Sibs writes. For wherever the Spirit dwells, the Spirit rules. He will not be an underling to your lusts, he says. He repairs the breaches of the soul. Yes, we must submit to him in all things in this battle. And yet, the victorious title of the inheritance to come is ours in Christ Jesus by the Spirit. The greatest war has already been fought for you on Calvary. And in your heart, when you were brought to a new birth, but daily we must now fight the finishing battles in our life of sanctification. Our ever-present foes, our flesh, the world, the devil, will unceasingly strive to tear down the foundation upon which we stand as children of the Most High. So how do you entertain the Spirit in this way? Well, Seb says, what you've got to do You've got to show to Satan. You've got to show to the world, to the church, to your friends, to everyone around you. You've got to show that you treasure the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And one way you do that is through self-denial. You know, we've lost the art of self-denial today. So much of Christianity today is self-affirmation. You know, John Calvin said the Christian life begins with self-denial. Begins with it. The Puritans were fond of saying things like that as well. You need to lose yourself. You need to lose your righteousness. You need to deny yourself if you're going to grow in grace at all. So Sib says this, We may know who dwells in a house by observing who goes in and when they come out. So we may know that the Spirit dwells in us by observing what sanctified speeches He sends forth from our lips and what delight He hath wrought in us to things that are special, and what price we set upon them. So in other words, if, 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 if you're going to really enjoy the indwelling of the Spirit through this spiritual warfare, you've got to show not only to other people, but even to yourself, by the way you spend your time, by the friendships you establish, what, what your loves are, what your delights are, what your joys are. Entertain the Holy Spirit. And then fourthly, I summarize it with these words, abiding presence, abiding presence. As the Spirit indwells us, we entertain Him by by viewing Him as a permanent resident of our souls. And we enjoy that abiding presence. We depend on that abiding presence. We love that abiding presence. And we surrender to that abiding presence. The Spirit, says Sibs, is the leader and the enabler of your soul. I think it was last year at this conference that I, I told you that God has provided me with a, a teacher's assistant, a TA, which has just been such a blessing to me for, for a whole year. I've actually said to, to this dear brother, I said, you know, it's hard to believe you only work for me for a year because I, I hardly know what I'd do without you right now. But you see, that's the way we ought to feel every day about the Holy Spirit. I don't know what I'd do without thee. Holy Spirit of God, Thou art my enabler, Thou art my strength, Thou art the one who art stirring the motions within me. The holy stirrings of the Spirit, Sib speaks of. That enriches me. That enables me to overcome the sin and the temptation that attacks me internally. The forces of darkness set against me externally. And I must remember every day if I would entertain that Spirit. Every day. That He's the Spirit of Christ. He's the Almighty Spirit. He's stronger than Satan. Satan's only a fallen angel. Satan's mighty. Mightier than we. But the Spirit is Almighty God. And He who rules in me, therefore, is greater than He who's attacking me from without. But you see, I don't realize that except through conflict. Through warfare. Perhaps you you heard of this illustration before. There was a restaurant in in Boston and began to sell this beautiful-tasting codfish. It was a great success all throughout Boston. Soon 
cities all around the United States heard about. They wanted the same codfish, so they sent codfish, but it didn't taste the same. It was I mean, sent in the mail. It, uh, something just didn't taste the same. The codfish had been dead for a few days by the time they arrived. So someone got the brilliant idea of sending the codfish live. So they put them in fish tanks and send the whole fish tanks to restaurants. And the codfish tasted soggy, and they couldn't figure it out. And finally someone said, aha, what we need to do is when we send the codfish live in the fish tank, we need to put catfish in there to attack the codfish, keep them moving all the time. They won't get lazy and sloppy. That's what they did. They get to the restaurant, they throw out all the catfish, and the codfish are delicious. Because they were constantly fighting for their survival. And you see, God knows with our wicked hearts that if Satan weren't there, you'd be like those sloppy codfish. They wouldn't bother to walk in the Lord's ways. And so we need that, you know. John Calvin said, we actually need the devil in this life. Because God uses the devil to stand everything up on his head so that we need him desperately, urgently, every day. Well, that's what Sibs is saying. We need this conflict. That's actually the gift of God to us. And by this, we entertain the spirit as we fight the good fight of faith. So that's the very first thing, the indwelling spirit. The second thing I believe that is involved in entertaining the spirit is that he is the sealer of our souls. The sealer of our souls. Now, Sibs wrote a lot about this. He wrote a, a whole book about it, basically, A Fountain Sealed. His sermons on 2 Corinthians 1, 22, 23, which I just read to you, published in 1655, in his exposition of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, are about the spirit sealing. And so it was a sermon on Romans 8, 15, and 16, the text Malcolm Watts brought us, The Witness of the Spirit, published in 1692. Now, there's a history here you need to understand, and I hope you, you bear with me for, for five, ten minutes here. What Sib said is that there are two distinct ways to understand the sealing of the Holy Spirit. John Owen disagreed with him. Puritans are not a monolithic group on everything as much as they agreed on things. They, they still have some differences. Owen said, we're sealed the moment we're born again, and the Bible gives no justification for a second kind of sealing. And Owen was following the Reformers, the early Reformers, who taught a one-to-one -one correlation between those regenerated by the Spirit and those sealed by the Spirit. So Calvin, for example, said it's impossible to believe without being sealed by the Spirit. Calvin said that the sealing represented the presence of the Spirit more than the activity of the Spirit. So the sealing work of the Spirit belongs to the very essence of faith. That was Calvin's view. But the Puritans looked at the whole thing just a tad bit differently. William Perkins, the father of Puritanism, drew more attention to the Spirit's activity in sealing the promise to the believer. So now the focus is no longer on the Spirit's indwelling presence, but on his activity in sealing. A Perkins' successor, Paul Baines, tried hard to reconcile Calvin and Perkins. So Baines taught that the sealing could be applied both to the Spirit as indweller and to the consequences of that sealing. Here's what Bain said. The Holy Spirit and the graces of the Spirit are the seal assuring our redemption. Now, Spurgeon, or uh, Spurgeon, Sibs agreed with his predecessor, Baines, although he emphasized more that daily conscious growing sense of sealing. He called it a confirmation of the believer's initial sealing. So what Sibs ended up teaching was what he called first a one-time sealing, and then a sealing that came later gradually in the consciousness of the soul in a more subjective way with spiritual maturity. 
So the once for all sealing that begins the moment you're, but that is established the moment you're born again, that happens, Sib said, immediately and totally. Sib said, it's like a king's image stamped upon wax. So the Spirit stamps believers with the image of Christ from the very moment of believing. And that produces in every believer's life a lifelong desire to be transformed fully into the image of Christ. My friend, if you don't have a desire to be transformed into the image of Christ, you're not a believer. That's what Sibs would say to you. Now this seal, which every believer possesses, whether he's conscious of it or not, serves as a mark, a stamp of authenticity. This is a real coin. It's stamped with the king's seal. It establishes the believer from the world. And so just as a merchant, says Sibs, marks their wares, and shepherds brand their sheep, so God seals his people in regeneration to declare they are now my rightful property and I have authority over them. Now that's pretty, that's not too hard to understand. But the second kind of sealing, Sib says, is a process. And what he means by that is this kind of growing assurance that grows within us, that I am indeed sealed, that the king's impress is upon me in truth. And that grows through experiences. It grows through daily spiritual encounter. It goes through this battle. It, it grows through, well, being in the Word and entertaining the Spirit through the means of grace as the believer grows into spiritual maturity. So Sibs writes it this way. The Spirit sealeth by degrees, yielding to the Spirit in one holy motion, will cause him to lead us to another holy motion, and so on forwards, until we be more deeply acquainted with the whole counsel of God concerning our salvation. Why did Spirit, why did Sibs emphasize this in relation to the Spirit? Well, I believe it was from a pastoral motivation. He writes somewhere in his works that he's pastoring three different kinds of Christians. He says, one kind lives under spirit of bondage. They lack even the reflect acts of faith. That looking back on their life, they can't even see the work of the Spirit. They're full of doubts and fears, and yet their lives show that they know the Lord Jesus Christ, but they just lack assurance. And then secondly, there are some Christians, he says, that are under the spirit of adoption, but they're just vacillating. One day they seem to have assurance, and another day they, they still have so many fears. They're sealed with evidences of faith, they can look back and say, yes, I believe the Lord's work here, but, oh, I've got so many perplexities and doubts and fears. So their degrees of assurance are just fluctuating and seem to be hanging in limbo at times. And uh, they need much more assurance. And then thirdly, he says, there are those who are carried, quoting here from him, with large spirits to obey their Father as the fruit of the direct seal of the Spirit that persuades them of their sonship to God. And so he identifies the seal with the immediate testimony of the Holy Spirit by which the Father's love is pronounced upon the believer. At times, as he's writing about this, he, he actually sounds a, a, a bit mystical. But he wards off that mysticism in two ways. First, he maintains that this special sealing is never to be divorced from the Word of God. He says the breath of the Spirit in us is suitable to the Spirit's breathing in the Scriptures. The same Spirit does not do contrary motions. The voice of the Spirit is always consistent with the voice of the Word. Secondly, he says the genuineness of that sealing of consciousness that I belong to the Spirit and the Spirit belongs to me and I belong to Christ and Christ belongs to me can be readily examined. You may know by the fruits of sanctification, by large measures of peace of conscience, by the spirit of adoption, whereby you may cry out in life's greatest trials, Abba, Father, fervent supplication, by conformity 
to the heavenly image of Christ. By applying yourselves to holy duties rather than old lusts, you may know of the testimony of the Spirit, the sanctifying fruits of the Spirit, will reveal that the Spirit's at work in you and the Spirit's sealing that is growing within you will continue to grow when you walk in the Spirit. Therefore, you entertain the Spirit by walking in the Spirit and you grow in that sealing consciousness. Now, Sibs goes on to say, and remember the Puritans had great trials. Most of them lost half their children. They were, most of them were in prison at one time or another for preaching the gospel. So they dealt a lot with trials. And Spurgeon, or Sibs, why do I keep going to Spurgeon? Sibs argues that in these trials, God gives extra measures of the consciousness of the spirit, spirits indwelling, sealing work. He has this one beautiful part where he says it's like a child when he's really hurt. He gets more love from his dad and his mom. It scoops him up in his arms and holds him close and kisses him. Smiles at him when he needs it most. And so when these conscious daily ceilings Growing in the midst of trial, Sib says, there are like sweet kisses from the Father vouchsafed to the soul. And then, well then, Paul can sing in the dungeon. Daniel can be calm in the lion's den. And his three friends in the fiery furnace can walk without the least fear. You see the parallels between what Sibs is saying? Even though he didn't use the language, extraordinary witness of the Holy Spirit, the parallels with what I'm saying here, Sibs said, to what Malcolm Watts said this morning. So this is a pastoral way. You must not read too much into this, but it's a pastoral way, rather than an academic way, of explaining this comforting work of a growing consciousness of my ceiling. I don't really think... Sibs will be upset if you called it something else than the word sealing. And yes, maybe he misunderstood Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, where it says, after that she believed you were sealed and thought there was some time in between the two, although he said there was a sealing initially. And yes, maybe Owen is right there, that the Greek actually doesn't say there's a period of time, and I think Owen is right. But I think Owen would understand Sibs' view that what we're talking about here is a daily growing sense of assuredness that I belong to Jesus and He belongs to me. And Sibs is saying, as you entertain the Spirit in the ways and will and word of God, it's God's normal way to cause that to grow. And therefore, what blessings come from entertaining the Spirit and the soul? He's talking about an experiential, behavioral, and character-modifying realization of the depth of the love of God so that we grow in the consciousness of this kind of sealing, which then in turn is a great boon to our sanctification. Our sanctification helps the sealing grow. The sealing helps the sanctification grow. Now finally, thirdly and fourthly, I'm going to be very brief here, Sib says, we entertain the Spirit in terms of His comforting role. He's not only the indweller and the sealer, but the comforter. Now, if you're a Christian, you know, you know that life and its difficulties can be very discouraging also as a Christian. Particularly when the promises of God and the providences of God seem to contradict each other, we're prone to lose our quiet confidence in God, to become disquieted like David, cast down. And you talk to your soul, my soul, why are you cast down? So on. Sib said, such disquiet and grief is like lead to the soul, heavy and cold. It's precisely at those times that we need to flee to the Spirit 
Ask Him to draw close to our souls and to quiet our souls to rest in God's sovereign will. And He excels in His writings in explaining why only the Spirit can comfort the battered soul of the believer. Listen to this. When the soul is distempered, it is like a distempered lock that no key can open. So when the conscience is troubled, what creature can settle the troubled conscience, can open the ambages, that is the winding passages, of a troubled conscience in such perplexity and confusion? And therefore, to settle the troubled conscience aright, it must be somewhat above conscience. And that which must quiet the spirit must be such a spirit that is above our spirits. You understand what he's saying? When you're really troubled, you can reason in your own conscience. Oh, yes, I've got the Lord and I've got his word. And you're trying to rise above your troubles, but you can't get above them because they're so big and they're surrounding you and they're suffocating you. And so he says, the only thing that can help you, that can rise above your conscience, is the Holy Spirit who's almighty. He's above your spirit. And He can deliver you from your bondage. He can comfort you and give you healing balm in your heart. And so the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, bringing to mind useful things and useful portions of the Word of God, says Sibs, at such times when we most need them. This is the love of the Spirit in our soul. And so the role of the comforter is always tied to the Word of God. Sib said, in times of discouragement, the believer often questions his own soul about, why am I so discontent? But he must not keep going into that abyss. But he must charge himself to trust God, the Spirit, and His Word, and recognize that the Spirit is his indwelling comforter, and as long as the Spirit is with him, he has no reason to be discouraged. So he said, ask the Spirit, help me. Help me to meditate on the promises of God. Wedge them home, Sibs writes. Wedge them home, Spirit of God, upon my heart. And so by using the promises, the Spirit helps me calm myself. Trust in the midst of distrust, in the midst of fears and troubles and discontent. You know, we had a woman in our church just a few weeks ago who was going through some really heavy trials. And she said to me, she just couldn't find anything to help her. And she was very discouraged. But then she said, I took the Bible and I copied out all my favorite promises and I plastered them all over the kitchen and everywhere I looked. So wherever I looked, I saw a promise of God staring me in the face. And she said, that does me more good than anything else. That's the Spirit. Taking the Word, comforting, comforting. That promise, comforting. That promise, comforting. Until you rise above your own condemning conscience. You rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and find relief in Him. And so Sib said, the Spirit is the one who gives you quiet rest in the Lord Jesus Christ, in His Word. And he calls this, as your soul then stabilizes that you re-enter the beauty of a well-ordered soul. Isn't that a nice expression? The beauty of a well-ordered soul, where the Word of God is predominant, the promises of God are predominant, you tune with the Spirit of God, you're entertaining the Spirit through the means of grace, and your soul finds relief, even if not a single circumstance around you is changed. So Sib says, would you be comforted and quieted in your own soul? Then labor to entertain the Spirit. Give room to His motions in your soul. And then finally, Sibs says, the way to entertain the Spirit, and here he turns negative, is not to grieve the Spirit of God. You can fail to entertain the Spirit negatively when you grieve Him. So when do you grieve Him? Well, Sibs has a rather ferocious list. He says, What greater indignity can we offer to the Holy Spirit than to prefer base dust as we are before His motions, leading us to holiness and happiness? What greater unkindness, yea, treachery, to lead directions of a friend to follow the counsel of an enemy? 
such as when we know God's will, yet will consent with flesh and blood in leaving a true guide and following a pirate. And so he goes on to explain what he means by that. He said, he was most critical of people who were members of churches who didn't exercise saving faith. He challenged those who claimed to have walked with God for many years, but whose lives showed little effect, little vital motion. And he says, of all sins, the sins of professors of religion grieve the spirit the most. And of all professors, those who have the most means of knowledge, the most spiritual opportunities, when they don't walk in them and don't entertain the spirit, they grieve the spirit the most. And he begins to list them. It's pretty searching. Spiritual sins, he says. Pride and envy. And an evil spirit grieve the Holy Spirit. Carnal sins grieve the Spirit too. They drown the soul in physical delights and defile the Spirit's temple, our own bodies. As long as we do not aim for a life of devotion and conformity, as long as we do not aim to entertain the Holy Spirit, we're grieving the Spirit. And then he gets really close to home. He says, we commonly grieve the Spirit of God when the mind is troubled with a multitude of busyness. When the soul is like a mill where one cannot hear another, the noise is such as takes away all fellowship with the Spirit. Could it be? One reason why, I say this to myself, one reason why I don't know more of the conscious indwelling of the Spirit is because I'm just plain too busy. Too much activity. Activity, said Sibs, is not synonymous with spirituality, which our popular Christian culture would, would have us to believe, of course. But we're called, rather, to humble dependence and meditation by the Spirit. And then Sibs says this, and I thought this was the most challenging of all. This grieves the Holy Spirit also. When men take the offices of the Spirit from him and try to perform those offices upon themselves. You know, A.W. Pink has a book, Work of the Holy Spirit. I think there's 32 chapters. Every chapter is the title of the office of the Holy Spirit. The illumination, the regeneration, and on and on it goes, comforter and so on. We cannot do the work of the Spirit without the Spirit. There are areas where we cooperate with the Spirit in our sanctification, but we depend on the Spirit in those as well. And, 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 and Sib says we grieve the Spirit when we think we'll first try to do it ourselves. Entertaining the Spirit doesn't mean we, we get everything tidy and neat ourselves so that therefore the Holy Spirit must come, but it means we use the means of dependency on the Holy Spirit to bless us in our souls. So that's what he means when he says we must entertain the Holy Spirit. We must entertain him as our comforter, as our indweller, as our sealer. But also we must not grieve him. Well, let me conclude now and say this. What Sibs is aiming at is that the Holy Spirit must actually be an integral part of our lives, our churches, our world. He really must be entertained in every facet of Christian life and experience. Because it's He who leads us, whose supreme purpose is to lead us to Jesus Christ. And in Christ we have all. And so Sip says, the relationship of most believers in his day, how much more that's true today, and the Holy Spirit is too often like a relationship between a husband and a wife in a bad marriage. What does he mean by that? Well, he means this. The husband uses his wife's services, but fails to communicate and celebrate his relationship. How can you reverse that situation? Well, Sip says... We need to make daily efforts to recognize and entertain the Holy Spirit, to open our hearts, share our thoughts and plans with God as we gaze by faith, spirit work prayer, by faith into the face of God.
But God comes to us with His Word. We go back in prayer. But daily we are to unburden and unbosom our souls to Him, gaze into His face, spread out our needs, ask Him to correct us and to guide us. We should walk in a relationship of communication with God through His Spirit, mediated through the knowledge of the Word, relying upon every office of the Holy Spirit as our counselor. And so Sibs concludes, the Holy Spirit then being in us, after He that prepared us for a house for Himself to dwell in, to take up His rest and delight in, He doth also become unto us a counselor in all our doubts, a comforter in all our distresses, a solicitor to all duty, a guide in the whole course of life, until we dwell with Him forever in heaven, unto which His dwelling here in us doth tend.